Hey there developers, have you ever wished your code could be completely bug free, avoiding all those annoying errors before they even happen? In this video, I'm going to teach you powerful techniques using your type system to make your program safe and more reliable, all without any extra effort. Stay tuned, because by the end of this video, you'll be writing code that's safe and protected from bugs. Welcome to Frankly Developing. I'm your host Frank and let's get started with the basics of type systems. Most current type systems are separating between something like primitive types and custom types. Primitive types are things like integers, doubles, sometimes strings, and custom types are your own self-defined domain-specific types you use in a project, classes you create, structures or enums. And if the type system is a strong type system, then you will get errors if you badly combine these. For example, if you take a string and assign it to an integer, that will not work. If you take your enum and assign it to a string, it won't work. All of these strange variations. And of course, it differs between languages what you can do. For example, you can assign an integer to a double maybe in your language, and it's automatically converted from the int to the double. Maybe it goes the same way, vice versa. Maybe it doesn't. So type systems differ a little bit between languages. The custom types also help you by limiting your methods that you can call. So if you have an object of your class, then you can call certain methods on it that are defined in the class. And if you write some other method, it's not compiling again. And similarly, if you have a function or method that needs parameters being passed to it, the type system makes sure with the help of the compiler that all of the arguments you pass in are matching. So if it needs an integer argument, you can't pass in a enum or maybe not a string or a custom object of your class. Again, depending on the strength of your type system. But how does all of this relate to proofs and writing bug-free programs? Well, let's take a step back on the theoretical side because the compiler based on this type system that your language offers is actually a proof system. It proves that all the code you write is correct, as correct as the type system can guarantee. If it's not, you get a counterexample. Just like in a mathematical proof, if it tries to prove something that is not true, it disproves it by giving you a counterexample. So you assign the string to the integer variable and the compiler gives you an error. That is just the proof system saying, here's a counterexample to assignments should usually work for these types, because here you're assigning it in the wrong way. And so if you have no error, this is guaranteed to work, but there's a slight problem in this guarantee. It's only as strong as the type system can guarantee. And if you look at, at languages like Haskell, they have a really strong type system. So a common saying in the Haskell community is, if it compiles, it works. Because the type system is so strong that once the compiler agrees that your program is good, it won't crash. There will not be any error at runtime. Keep in mind that when we talk about bug-free here, we have to make a small disclaimer. There's two things that can go wrong. Just like you can write your program in the right way, or you can write the right program. There's a small distinction that is really, really big and important actually, because if someone tells you, I want this feature and you implement it and it breaks down and doesn't work, that's one kind of wrong, which type systems and compilers can help you to avoid. But if they tell you, I want this feature and you implement something completely different, but that works really, really well, it's still wrong, but a compiler or tool of any kind can't tell you that it's wrong because it's a completely working program. So we talk about verification versus validation in these things. Validation you can't do automatically, but verification is where the proof system comes in. So let's take another look at this example. We can see that there's null being directly dereferenced, and that's definitely not bug free. And there are some quick fixes here which you can look at, but that's not really good enough, is it? It's like none of these really gets rid of the problem as a whole. Just barely makes things work. We want something stronger than that. 
So one thing you can do is you can do warnings as errors and configure your compiler. Say so I want these nullables to be actual errors. And now if you go back to your program, it turns into an actual error. It doesn't compile anymore. It'll save you from this kind of bug throughout your whole project. It's never going to become a bug again and crash at runtime. It'll always stop you at compile time already. If you want to know more about this, I did a whole video on refactoring um, a project to be able to use this kind of approach. It's not as easy as we did it in this example here in general. You can take a look at it. And another thing is if you want to work with nulls in general, there's some strategy involved that you may want to think about in your project as well. And I did another video on that, how to deal with nulls in your project overall. Do you want it? Where do you want it? Is it possible to avoid, etc. So if you like these kind of videos or this video here, please consider subscribing to the channel. It will be much appreciated. Thank you very much. So let's take a look at another example. We have a string here that's an email and the variable is called email. But really, when you work with this, there's no guarantee. It's not a bug-free way to have an email encoded like this. Because the type system only knows string. Um, once you use this variable in a different way, and you assign it, for example, to something else, that'll just work. The variable is still called email. And now if someone does, I don't know, tries to split based on the add separator from the email, that will not work well. Right? It does work, it doesn't crash, but you don't get these two aspects of it. It's kind of problematic. It can cause bugs. And we want to get safer than that. So in this case, it's a typical case of something called the primitive obsession. Because you're using primitive types like a string and really want to represent a higher level type like an email address, it makes sense to introduce that into a type. Introduce something like a class email and work with that later on. Just so once you have the class and you create it, it can initially do all the consistency checks, make sure it's a valid email address, which isn't that easy to do after all. And then once you have an object of the type email, the type system guarantees you this is a valid email in combination with the code that you do. Really, the type system doesn't know that much about emails, but separating the primitive type from the custom type is a good way to ensure that in your type system, every simple usage of a primitive string as an email doesn't work anymore. Because once you have your class email in some sense, you don't define it completely now, and I have an email E, I can't assign a string to it. So that won't work. The compiler just won't accept it anymore. And if you want to know more on how to deal with these problems, how to avoid this kind of primitive obsession. I've also made another video specifically on that, which you might want to watch and see other examples like that. Let's take a look at a more complex example. Let's say you want to make a game or something with an AI where you have a rocket and we model it as a record rocket. And the rocket has to have, for example, let's just take a simple pool for now. It has to have oxygen to send astronauts up into space. It needs to have fuel as well, for example. So that's just a dollar structure we have normally. And then you would have something like a method that launches the rocket. Right. So you can launch it, rocket up. But really, if it doesn't um, have access to O2 and fuel, you shouldn't be able to launch it. So you would have some code that does lots of to check here. If it doesn't have this, or it doesn't have fuel, maybe you throw an exception, uh, some real operation exception, with a nice message that you should tank it up with fuel and O2. But again, like this is not using the compile system, the type system, the compiler to support us. It's really just checking at runtime and giving you errors at runtime, which you need to handle again, which is problematic and can potentially cause bugs again. So how can we make this safer? How can we build a, uh, actually it should be called rocket, not record. 
how can we build this rocket in a way that we can only launch it and write code for launching it when it's fueled up? How does that work? Well, there's actually a nice little trick to do that. So if we start off with an um, empty rocket. Well, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have oxygen, it doesn't have fuel. So the next thing we could do is provide a method that, I'll skip the type for now, um, we add fuel for example. And once we add fuel to an empty rocket, all we get is like a rocket with fuel. So that needs a separate type. And that would also be our return type. I could do a similar thing with the other two, so a rocket that has no fuel but oxygen would look similarly. We have take an empty rocket, we can turn this, don't really need that. We can return the rocket with O2 or with fuel, depending on what you added. And now we have these two objects. And of course, now we're missing something. So the rocket with fuel is needing the O2. So we want to be able to add it. All we really get then is the final rocket. Uh, we don't really need a true, true here anymore. Now we have sure the O2 and we have the fuel. And that would be our rocket, but really, let's just throw all of that away, remove this property, remove this property, and that's really it. We have the rocket with fuel, you add oxygen, you get a full rocket. Same thing here, if you have a rocket with oxygen, and you get fuel to it, you get a proper rocket, and you can launch that rocket. Now, once you have all this in place, it's like a complete redesign and now it's a safe design in terms of all these bugs that could occur. So if you write some code and someone says, oh well, let's just start with the rocket. I'm sure now it's a fully tanked rocket, but that's fine if you have an empty rocket, however. Well, it's not a rocket, so you can't assign it. That's a compile error. You need to start with the empty rocket as a type as well. And then if you take your rocket and you look at what you can do with it, well, you can't launch it. It's not possible to launch this rocket at all. The compiler will help you and support you to make sure you don't launch this rocket yet. Instead, you have to add fuel to it. And if you try to launch it, well, it's still not allowed because we need both fuel and oxygen, so you can't launch it, and the compiler stops you from launching it again. Now you can add oxygen to that and you get a fully tanked rocket and all of a sudden it's perfectly fine to launch it and the compiler is fine with that and as you noticed on the way the auto completion of our IDE which is based on the type system again is also supporting us on the way there so we start off with the empty rocket and it immediately tells us oh maybe you want to add oxygen on that rocket that you get back you know, maybe you want to add fuel and oh maybe you want to launch it not a lot of things to type, so very little effort and a lot of safety. Like in this sense, you cannot ever create an object of a rocket and forget to add fuel and a two to it because every rocket object now is a fully tanked up rocket. And you have to solve the empty rocket. That's the only thing you need to be able to think of. Do you want a full or an empty rocket? Well, with this kind of approach outside of any rockets in your real world, it's just a little bit of a trick to make sure that can use these types. There's several more of these tricks, but I think you're going to like this one if you give it a try. I hope you enjoy this demonstration and the few tricks you can do with types, which is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more in the type systems that you can use, even if they are not the strongest in your language. With a few tricks here and there, there's a lot of bugs you can avoid to ever come into existence. There's nothing more powerful at our disposal than a compiler that stops errors just before they ever happen, just by not compiling. So thank you very much for watching, and as always, have fun developing.